Hey, you listen to Nothing to Off the Table, the podcast with no subjects too taboo to discuss. If you don't like it, why don't you take care of somewhere else? <laughs> yeah, I know they all look alike. No, they don't. And the earth is... Flat. Flat. The earth is flat. My reality, my senses tell me that the earth is flat and stationary. Everybody here can agree on absolutely one thing, which is it is not a globe. So you're saying that when, when far-right groups come here and throw demonstrations and have their rallies, they don't necessarily have to throw the first punch in order for you to, to react violently. The purpose of these groups in common to Portland is to attack people. God hates America. Vile land of the sodomite damned. The most ungrateful and the most arrogant anti-God nation that ever existed. Enter the Phelps clan and other followers of the Westboro Baptist Church in Topeka, Kansas, who've become infamous for picketing the funerals of gay people with signs that carry slogans like, God hates fags. Welcome back, everybody, to uh, yet a barking dog in the background. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Another episode of Nothing's Off the Table, and we have a, a very special guest today. Um, our guest today is uh, a best-selling author um, of at least 13 works right now, uh, and uh, you got one coming out in January, I believe, correct? Yeah. And uh, let's see, your New York Times best-selling list, uh, and let me just throw it out there. If you don't know who we're talking to, it's Brad Taylor. Brad, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. No, it's, it's our pleasure, honestly. I swear, we've been trying to do this, what, for a year yeah, or so? about a year. Yeah, but, um, so I know you're a busy guy. Um, so a little bit about your background and your, your barking dog. Uh, if you bring that dog she to my house. Barks. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you bring him to my house, my wife's Filipino, we might have, you know, special <laughs> snack or something. But um, speaking of uh, Filipinos in, in Asia, you're, you were born in Okinawa. I was, yeah. So is my dad was uh, in the Air Force. He was fighting in Vietnam, and uh, I, uh, that's where I was born. Actually, as a small, uh, it's kind of a real coincidence, my daughter was born in Okinawa as well, and she was born at the same uh, hospital I was. And when she was born, I asked, you know, how's this hospital changed? Because, you know, through the years, it's been different camps. Mm-hmm. It was a Marine Corps camp, an Army camp, and all this. Right. And it turns out they had the same four uh, birthing rooms forever so there's a one in four chance my daughter was born in the same room as me jesus yeah that um that hospital is finally gone believe it or not oh is uh, it but they, it's gone yeah they built a brand new one out there but it it's it'd been there forever yeah um, so it was in the, the naval hospital then yeah well when my dad was there it was an army hospital when huh. my daughter was born it was a naval hospital okay um so i'm assuming you guys were at uh was it, it's not is it Kadena? yeah yeah Kadena? we lived on Kadena. i worked on tory station Okay. First, the first special forces degree, but our house was on Kadena. Sure. Which, uh, wow, that was a perfect segue. So, how does somebody like you, the special forces guy, all this hua, uh, go navy? Oh, wait, sorry. I said we weren't going to say that. <laughs> but um, how did you get into writing? Uh, I actually, it was just kind of a bucket list thing. Hmm. I always wanted to write a book. It was just something I had in my head that I was going to do. Mm-hmm. And I left a special mission unit at Fort Bragg and came down. I was on a break from deployments, uh, teaching at the Citadel. Mm-hmm. Uh, in Charleston, South Carolina, and I mean, it was a huge break. Talk about a complete uh, nine in the morning. I'd be like, "What do we do now?" Because sure. it's, it's really slow. And so I uh, told my wife I was going to write a book, and I did, I just thought it would sit on the bedside table. I didn't think it'd go anywhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then it sold, and that kind of went from there. And and look at you now. Yeah. So how um how was the process of getting a uh, not only an editor but a, a publisher? Uh, well, it was, it was really long. Um, I mean, I was still on active duty. A lot of things happened. I, I came out on the promotion list for Colonel. Mm-hmm. Uh, I then had, I, like I said, the book sold. I had to make a decision. My daughter was in high school. Uh, all kinds of things were happening. And, and I just did the old-fashioned route. I mean, I wrote the book, and then I paid for a freelance editor to help me make it better. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I went to the bookstore and looked at books that were in my genre, and they always thanked the uh, – uh, agent in the back, and I sent out a bunch of query letters or whatever they want. Everybody wants something different. Some wants five pages, some wants a synopsis, some wants two page synopsis, mm-hmm. some want a query letter. They all want something different because in today's uh, 
uh, marketplace where you used to have to mail an envelope with a stamp, then they knew you were actually physically trying to get to them. Right. Now you can shotgun 100 emails out in one blast. And so they want to make sure that you're, okay, this guy actually went to my web page, he has looked at what my requirements are, and mm-hmm. here's what he's submitting. Um, and that's what I did. I mean, I, you know, people talk about getting a bazillion uh, rejection letters. Mm-hmm. I actually was even worse than that. I just got nothing. <laughs> I mean, they just assumed, <laughs> you're not even worth the time of telling you no. And so I just kept sending, kept sending until I uh, found an agent. Mm-hmm. So, uh, real quick, I, I just wanted to make sure that you understood that this is not necessarily a family friendly show. So, uh, <laughs> feel free to, uh, whatever you want to say or, or do sure. it, it's fine with us. In fact, um, I let a lot of F bombs slip. So it's, I, that's why well, I that's my wife says, she says, you've been out of the army for a while. Why do you keep cursing? Well, it's just kind of ingrained. But, yeah. Especially at this point, right? More like, yeah. uh, institutionalized, but, um, I brought that up for a specific reason because, um, and I should have talked about this uh, pre-show, but I uh, I failed to do so. Things, topics that are off limits. I know anything classified is going to be automatically off yeah, limits. Yeah, that's basically it. Anything uh-huh. I did in my in the special mission unit's off limits. Right, I, I can't talk about it. Well, I, I figured as much, but um, just the fact that you bring it up, I'm sure everybody's going to be like, "Oh shit." Uh, and uh, I'm I'm not going to lie, I'm kind of fanboying a little bit right now. Uh, <laughs> Just because I've read um, almost all of your books. I'm working on number 13 right oh, now. I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and that's that's the reason why I want to get you on, primarily because, number one, I'm a fan. But number two, I'm, I'm in the process now of writing a book myself. Um, yeah. So, you know, I've got, got a little bit of similarities there. And I know a lot of mm-hmm. people uh, like the genre of writing that you do. But... Um, I know you've done hundreds and hundreds of interviews, and I know it's probably the same old questions, but uh, I want to get to know Brad. You know, okay. The the writer's great. The stories are awesome, but let's talk about Brad. What what does Brad like to do for fun? Uh, well, nowadays I don't have a whole lot of time to do anything. I, I like. Uh, I would have said golf. I had my knee replaced, so I can't do that anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, I shoot. I love shooting. If I get a chance to get out to the range, that's basically and really right now spending time with my family sure when if i get some time off i'm spending time with my family whatever they want to do if they want to go you know hiking if they want whatever they're going to want to do that day that's what i'm doing Mm -hmm. all right well uh great interview thank you for coming on the show and uh no i'm just kidding (laughs) um so i i think obviously the answer to this question is the the guides that you worked with but the specific inspiration uh for pike is it one guy or is it a conglomerate of many guys that you served with it's kind of a conglomeration of people I served with. Some are heavier than others. Um, the, uh, you know, people always ask me, are you Pike Logan? And no, I'm definitely not Pike Logan. I mean, it took a, uh, it's very hard to get to the level of skill set of the uh, unit I was in. It's very hard to get in there. Sure. Um, but what I usually compare it to is it's kind of like uh, the PGA Tour. It's, it's only 1% of the, of the world can play on the PGA Tour. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that's it. But nobody's ever heard the hundredth on the money list. He's some guy slugging away. He's on the PGA Tour, but he's slugging away. Right. And uh, everybody's heard of Tiger Woods. And Pike Logan's kind of Tiger Woods. I served with a bunch of Tiger Woods, mm-hmm. uh, but I am not Tiger Woods. I'm just on the tour. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say you're a little bit light. Uh, a little bit light to be Tiger. Um, yeah. But you know, we'll get you out in the sun. It'll be okay. Um, no, it's uh, it, it's the stories are kind of. I know they're embellished a little bit. Because they probably have yeah, to be to, definitely. to yeah. um, still sell. But I mean, still... the actual tactical side of the house, I mean, I've seen a lot of that stuff go on. Uh, what's really embellished is, is the pace of the action. Because in the real world, somebody says, if you were going to write a book about what it was really like to do operations, you'd get 300 pages of PowerPoint briefings. And there'd be, <laughs> you know, me right. begging this guy and begging that guy and begging this guy and begging that guy. And then five pages of action at the end. Right. You wouldn't get this long. And the truth of the matter is that, most of the time, you either knock out the uh, uh, terrorist threat early, early on. You find some guy who's got a bunch of bomb-making material mm-hmm. in his room, which is not that sexy. It's just kind of like kick the door and, well, look, there he is. Uh, or you miss the attack, and he blows a bunch of people up. Right. There is rarely ever a Jack Bauer scenario where the clock's ticking, and this guy's got the bomb, and you know it, and you're trying to stop him. Right. That just doesn't really happen. A lot of folks don't understand and realize that there's uh, so much hurry up and waiting that goes yeah. on. So much, 
boredom. Well, there's always something. So if you wanted to do an operation, you know, pick a country in Tanzania, and you'd say, hey, this bad guy's in Tanzania, and here's what I want to do. Well, you've got to brief everybody. Mm -hmm. CIA's got to get on board. State Department's got to get on board. Everybody's got to get on board. Sure. And everybody gets a vote. Uh, no, the Tanzania wheat crop sales are going to affect the political situation. We can't have you come in. There's a bazillion. I've mm -hmm. done a hell of a lot more planning for missions than actual missions, put it that way. Sure. Um, well, that makes, it makes total sense. And of course, uh, you, you guys are the operators and, and the door kickers. And of course you put in for whatever mission is like you said, and it either gets, uh, you know, up checked or down checked. That'd be a pretty sorry book. I read 300 pages and Pike got up to the point of actually deploying and they turned him down. <laughs> and, you know, I was yep. just like, well, that's, there's your realism. Well, I was going to say, but how true is that? How many times yeah. you sat on the tarmac and, and waited to go yeah. and, and nothing. Um, but so I feel your pain there. I was, uh, I did a lot of time as a fleet Marine force doc corpsman. Mm -hmm. Um, so there, there was definitely a lot of that hurry up and yeah. wait and, uh, getting up at three thirty for a, uh, show up time of like nine, you know, <laughs> go to the army at, at five and just anyway, a lot of, a lot of fun, but a lot of, a lot of downtime and frustration. Yeah. So I don't know if you can answer this question or not. I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, and if you, um, if you can't answer just say pineapple juice. Okay. We'll, we'll just go with that. Um, that's kind of a inside joke around, around here on the network. So, um, I had heard, and I don't know if it's true or not, that, um, the unit that you were in, uh, also takes, uh, other services. That's a big pineapple juice. Pineapple juice. I, I, I'm not going to talk about the, Roger. about the unit. Okay. All right. Well, that's the only thing I really wanted to ask you. We'll move right away from that. Um, but uh, <laughs> you, you can't blame a guy for trying here, you know? Um, sure. But as far as uh, the glamorization of what you do and um, the glamorization of the books, I want to talk about um, – the other side that nobody ever sees unless you've been around and done some stuff, the physical toll that it takes on your body. And oh yeah. Because you mentioned earlier that you've, you've already had what one knee, uh, one knee surgery was a replacement or yeah, total replacement. Yeah. Jeez. And, and you can't, you can't be a whole heck of a lot older than I am. No. I can't, and I, I had, yeah, I've had shoulder surgery, elbow surgery, shoulder surgery, in both shoulders, mm -hmm. reconstruction surgery and, and had my knee replaced last year. So, Right. So, so those are some of the things that people don't ever really get to see. Um, I wanted to talk about, and, and you being, coming from where you came from, I, I have a theory as to uh, PTSD and, and those that suffer from it and seem to be susceptible to it and those that uh, are able to, I don't know, not maybe not be affected, but able to compartmentalize better. And my theory is is that um, the special warfare operators like yourself, it seems like uh, you guys, the training that you guys go through to get to where you're at, to where you're actually operating, I I feel that it sets you guys up for success as far as being able to uh, maybe handle the stresses of what you've seen uh, daily. I uh, I would disagree. Okay. I say that it does there. You do go, it's, it's a stressful existence even when you're not in combat. Sure. I mean, every day is selection at the other unit. It was just every day you're competing for a slot. Mm -hmm. One day you're the hero, next day you're zero, and you're on the street. But, uh, uh, I mean, I know plenty of people. That it's not, it's, it certainly is not some magic wand. Mm -hmm. There is no uh, shield that somebody's going to hold up. Oh, it, sure. PTSD affects everybody. Absolutely. Um, I, you know, uh, I also co-host a, uh, another podcast that we do. It's called JTF 22 to zero, where we are actually trying to combat the, um, the stigmas, if you will, the myths about it and, and trying to mm -hmm. get people to realize that it's okay to ask for help. Right. Um, and, and that actually is probably just in the soft community alone. Um, cause it's been a long time since I was in conventional forces, but in the soft community, the biggest problem is nobody wants to ask for help because it, it looks like a weakness and then it just starts eating at them. Sure. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, and you know, the units I've been with, they're, you know, they're conventional units, but it's the same thing, you know, Marine Corps infantry, they've got this big ego and right. it, it's also seen as a weakness in that area. Uh, the but one, I mean, what you, your comment there is, is it's kind of a prevalent comment that, you know, oh, those guys can take it where the other guys can't. 
Mm -hmm. Well, if I'm in that unit and I have PTSD, now I've been told I'm supposed to be able to take this because I'm in this unit. Now I don't go seek help. Right. That makes perfect sense. And that's, and that's why I want to bring it up because, uh, I feel it's important to bring awareness for everyone. Yeah. And, and the other big problem that we're having, I, th I think right now is with, uh, first responders, um, law enforcement, mm -hmm. your uh, paramedics, your correctional officers, because they're, they're, um, kind of still in the same book, right? Um, it's a weakness for them to go see help. Not only right. that, but if you're a cop, then they could take your gun away. Then you can't do right. your job at all. So, right. um, I, I'm sure you have, I've, I've lost too many, uh, too many brothers to, to suicide and I just want to do whatever I can to maybe if I save one yeah, life, definitely. you know, one life's worth it. But all right, let's get off of the, the, uh, fricking depressing topic here <laughs> as, as if this show isn't depressing enough as it is. Um, anyway, Oh, so we got a commenter in the room that uh, wants to. He wants me to comment or have you comment on uh, Marcinko's books. Uh, I uh, I never read his fiction books. I read his very first book, mm -hmm. and Rogue Warrior, the supposed nonfiction book. Right. And he's in the back of a heli or aircraft. He's about to parachute in to do this real world mission, and um, he gets on the ground and realizes he's he's in the airplane. He realizes he's got blanks. They loaded blanks in my magazines. It's a training mission. And he gets all mad because he thought it was real world. And the first thing I thought was, you had somebody else load your magazines? <laughs> right. I mean, how did that happen? Right. Did they give you the gun with a blank adapter on it? And you didn't realize it was there? I mean, <laughs> right. didn't you go to the arms room and get your own gun? <laughs> so, I don't know. Well, I'm sure there's some embellishment there, too, to, to build the story. Um, I actually got to meet him uh, this is a crazy story. I was in uh, Great Lakes, Illinois. It's when Rogue Warrior came out and that um, he was doing a book signing tour and all the exchanges. Mm -hmm. And um, the dive motivator at recruit side um, was was served on, I guess, SEAL Team 6 with him at some point when he was a younger sailor. So every day at lunch, I was, I was trying to go back to recon. Every day at lunch, I'd go under the pool and I'd, I'd do my swimming. And I walk in, you should talk to the chief. And uh, lo and behold, there's there's Dick Marcinko in there, big dude. And what threw me off is that he's kind of got like a high pitched, uh, almost <laughs> feminine voice, you know. And it just it didn't fit his his body body type at all. But um, long story longer, we got to talk a little bit for maybe five minutes. Uh, Chief introduced me to him, and and then uh, Chief said, "Yeah, Doc's going back to recon here." And and then he starts going off, you know, "Oh, recon this, recon that. You need to go to Buds this, go to Buds that." I'm like, "Yeah, whatever." And then uh, as I was leaving, he's like, oh, oh, hey, Doc, I don't want to hear any of that raw shit. <laughs> Roger that. Raw, <"Rah>, sir. <laughs> he freaking <laughs> makes me push right there. It was awesome. <laughs> so that's, that's like my only cool story that I have ever in my life. Um, not really, but a lot of them I'm not going to tell because my wife will probably listen later. <laughs> but, uh, um, so deployments-wise, I know you can't talk a lot about them, but um, – for for those that are all into the oh my god it's such a glamorous life, can you talk a little bit about the toll that it takes on your family? Oh, enormous toll! I, the um, my daughter was born uh, two days after nine. I was about to deploy for nine. Nine eleven happened, and we're out the door. Mm -hmm. And my wife was nine months pregnant. Jeez. Um, and then the uh, conveniently. <laughs> Uh, President Bush had grounded all aircraft in the continental United States, so we couldn't even take off. Holy shit. So we're sitting around waiting on, you know, what are we doing? Where are we going? What's going on? And uh, then she was born, and then I went off to war. Hmm. Uh, and then I was gone, you know, over and over again, back and home, off and gone, back and home, and off and gone. Mm -hmm. um, so often that by the time I went to um, the Citadel, she was, I think, six at that time, seven. And um, I was taking her to school for the first time, and I was wearing a uniform. And she said, what are you wearing a costume for? <laughs> she didn't even realize that I was in the army. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, I guess, especially in your line of work, too. But um, it's... Uh, but I, yeah, I, I missed, I mean, I missed anniversaries, birthdays, Christmases, Thanksgiving, just like everybody else that's serving, really. It's sure, just, just, sure. And, and, and I'm just, the reason I bring it up is, is again, people think that it's uh, this glamorous life, but it's it's really hard. You guys don't do it for the money. You don't do it for the right. pay. You don't do it for the fame or fortune. Um yeah, it's, it is really hard. You don't even realize how hard it is because uh, everybody's living that life. Mm -hmm. It's just the life. That's right. what everybody's doing. And we came down to, uh, like I said, uh, when the last assignment was at the Citadel, 
And uh, I mean, I'm literally like, this is how normal people live. <laughs> I mean, you, you get up and go to work and you don't have to worry about getting shot at. You just kind of, everybody's having fun and having parties and first Friday here and coming over for a drink and that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, and I'd completely lost track of what, you know, what it was like without being there. Hmm. That sucks. Um, but you know, you're, you're home now for them, uh, yeah. in, in between stints and, uh, and you said your, your oldest is in high school. Is that correct? No, she's now, she just graduated college. Oh, okay. She was, she was entering high school when I had to make all these decisions about the book and about uh, whether I was going to take the promotion and I ended up sure. the promotion down and decided to give writing a go. Uh, but now that's, that was, she's just graduated college last year. So. Oh, that's outstanding. So you at least got to be home for that. For the yeah, high school, well, uh, was, yeah, that's the main reason. Is I started getting emails about uh, you know you're going to go to your unaccompanied tour to Pakistan. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. And um, I was like, eh, I had enough of that. Yeah, I don't blame I'm, you. I'm not doing it anymore. I and so you. I turned it down and retired. So uh, what what are the plans um, for Pike? I don't want you to give anything away. Is this going to be something that goes on for forever? Are we going to branch uh, off? I don't know. I mean, nobody's more surprised than me to have uh, you know my 14th book's coming out. I, I had no idea that would happen. Hmm. Uh, I didn't think I'd have one book published, much less this many. So yeah, I'll keep writing them until uh, you know I run out of ideas. I'm working on book 15 right now. Holy smokes! So how long does it take you to write a book, average? Well, it used to. I for a while there, I was doing two books a year, um, which was crushing. Because I, I go overseas and do the book research tour or book research trip. I mean, I just got back from Taiwan and Australia for the book 15. I was all over Brazil for uh, Hunter Killer, which comes out in January. Um, so you spend a lot of time on the ground when you're doing uh, – what had happened was I, I didn't – I wasn't making any money as a writer. I mean, uh, and so I did a lot of contracting just like you know everybody else does. Sure. Okay, let me put my horse shingle out. Look at me. And so – uh, I would look at my schedule and say, okay, the book's due in December. I've got a contract from July until January. Um, so I got to get the book finished in July. So I did. And I, then I would bug my publisher, you know, why aren't you putting the book out? Why aren't you putting the book out? Because I don't know anything about publishing. Mm -hmm. I'm still weak on that. Um, because I write about current events. And current events, the problem with them is they're current. If something happens that alters the trajectory of – the planet, then the book could be worthless. For instance, uh, One Rough Man was had an Iranian theme to it, and we were rattling sabers against Iran big time in 2011 when it came out. Mm -hmm. And I kept telling my publisher, if we go to war with Iran, this book is worthless. Nobody, <laughs> the entire plot's doomed. Get the book out. Right. And they said, hey, yeah, you're not our only author, dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have more than just you. You're scheduled for December. Glad we got it in July, but it's coming out in December. Hmm. And... Um, that happened for about four books because I'd get them in six months early, and they said, okay, smartass, you want to do this, we'll do one every six months. <laughs> and so I said, uh, okay, and I did it, and by about – I did it for three and a half years, and it was just ended up crushing it. I mean it was just brutal. Hmm. Um, and so I you know, said, uh, no mas, no mas. <laughs> Let's go back to one a year, and I won't complain anymore. Right. Um I've noticed there's there's a lot of jujitsu in your books. Yeah. Do you train? I, well, I used to. Okay. I, I, by by no means am I some kind of you know, uh, you know, hunter a killer on the, the mat. Um, but you you had to have a baseline anyway, just serving. You always went and rolled, and we had a, a gym where we had trainers there all the time. You could go roll anytime. Mm -hmm. And there's certainly guys in the unit that that you know would give Ricky Ortiz a, a money when they get in the ring, but it's not me. Hmm. <laughs> So, and now with my knee and everything, I haven't grappled in quite a while. Sure. Yeah, um, I, I love jiu-jitsu. And I think that's the first couple times I um, came across that in your books. I was like, oh, wait a minute. Now, now I'm, I'm hooked. Yeah. Um, you know. Yeah, the hardest thing is because, you know, there's uh, – I mean, especially if you do jiu-jitsu, there's a, a couple – I mean, there's a core set of skills mm -hmm. that you'll see over and over. Now, there's some fancy stuff that people do. But basically, it's a core set of skills. Right. You know, rear naked choke, that guy's out. You know, triangle choke, that guy's out. Yep. So now I'm trying to you know, uh, expand the repertoire. And I'm like, well, you've got to be able to describe it so somebody who doesn't know jiu-jitsu knows what it is. But not do it in such a way that somebody who does know jiu-jitsu says, that's so fake. That would never happen. <laughs> right. Uh, and so it's, uh, well, it's kind of like you know, um, tracking terrors and how we do things. And the, the digital world is how we do that. Mm -hmm. Telephones are like a beacon. 
Right. And somebody said, I don't know why you're always fighting these guys with telephones. And I'm like, that's like saying, I don't know why you're always pulling a gun out. <laughs> I mean, it's, right. it's something that happens. That's just what happens. Uh, so the hardest thing I have now is when I'm developing the fight scenes is trying to come up with something that I haven't done a hundred times before. Yeah. It's That's so, also not um, so complicated. It, you know, confuses everybody. Well, you, you know, uh, I, I, I've trained for, I don't know, 10, 12 years or so. And, and, uh, my, my professor always says, if you don't know self-defense, you don't know jujitsu because there's, you know, yeah. so, so much sport jujitsu out there now that, uh, it, they're starting to water it down almost like karate. Uh, yeah. Almost. Yeah. Or Taekwondo breaking boards type stuff. Right. Instead of yeah. kind of self-defense. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely has a uh, real world uh, applicability to it. Um, especially from, you know, getting grabbed from behind or getting knocked yeah. down. And uh, it's just, man. I, I it was, always goes to the ground. Always. That's the whole basis. <laughs> I, I have, uh, I've been it's in. It's always going to go to the ground. Let me go ahead and take him to the ground. I, I've always, I've been in a lot of fights growing up. Um, I've always been the small guy, you know, get picked on a lot. And there came a point where I didn't want to get picked on anymore. So yeah. uh, every fight I've ever been is ended up right there on the ground. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not saying I'm some Billy badass. I got my ass kicked plenty of times, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just what it is. You know, fights end up on the ground. So, uh, is this something that, uh, you could maybe see yourself getting back into or is with your knees? It... I, I don't know if I could with my knee. I mm-hmm. mean, it's just so hard. It's, they, there's a lot of, you know, I kind of wish I hadn't done my knee, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. I talked to a ton of people who said, I wish I'd have done it a hundred years earlier. Mm-hmm. And I did mine. And I'm kind of like, I wish I hadn't done it because it still hurts. And there's a lot of things they don't tell you about. Number one, which is kind of, sounds like I'm whining, <laughs> but I guess I am. I can't do TSA pre anymore. Hmm. I can't go through the metal detector. So it doesn't even matter if I have TSA pre. I still got to go do everything like everybody else that because sucks. of my knee. Uh, it only bends. Uh, it doesn't, you know, like you can touch your calf to your, your back of your thigh. At least I can touch my calf to the back of my thigh on my right leg. Mm-hmm. Left leg goes to about 60 degrees. Uh, it pops when I walk. And it's just, it's not strong enough. I mean, it, if I asked him if I could do some grappling, he'd probably lose his mind. Because right now he's told me I can't go skiing. Hmm. So... He probably wouldn't want it. Yeah. What do they know? I mean, I could probably roll with just, uh, you know, and say, leave my knee in long. Sure. But that's not really that fair because it's a pretty good target. Yeah. Well, you know, it depends. If you're if you're competing, sure. But if you're just rolling to, to get exercise and, uh, you know, just maybe learn something, do some grappling, mm-hmm. then, you know, choose your partners wisely, I guess. But Yeah. Um, well, since I left Siddle, we had a club over Siddle. We used to roll all the time, and uh, that was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Level four combative guys would come in and all that kind of stuff, and so that was fun. Uh, but uh, yeah, ever since then, I haven't really done much at all. I tell you what, it's the best therapy I've ever had. You know, yeah, it's free. Where else can you choke somebody out legally? You know, right, and, and they <laughs> thank you for it. You know, and yeah. uh, you walk off, you're exhausted, but you feel fantastic. And uh, I, I try to. I'm. I guess I'm one of those jujitsu uh, psychos that tries to recruit everybody into it. You yeah. know, but um, but it really is. It's it's a lot of fun, and uh, I think one of the proudest days I ever had was um, my son, who's eight, came up to me and said, "Daddy, I want to do jujitsu." Oh, like, that's cool. Yes, <laughs> my boy. But uh, <laughs> um, all right, so I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit here. What's some of the uh, the funnier combat stories you have? Uh, well, let me see if I could tell it without giving away too much. Yeah. Okay. I'll just tell you, I, I was on an aircraft going into a target, um, and it was a long flight, long, 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 long flight. And, uh, I've got all kinds of stuff all over me. Uh, you know, you've got all kinds of kits. It's a long flight. I had it all set down. It's a blacked out aircraft. You can't, uh, uh, you can't see anything, you know, it's completely blacked out. Mm-hmm. And, um, we get the one minute call, one minute, one minute. And so I set my weapon down, start snapping everything together. And, uh, then we get, you know, 20 seconds. And I can't find my weapon. It's laid on the floor of the aircraft. We were Chinook. It's a big bird. Mm-hmm. I couldn't find it. I'm scrambling around on my hands and knees going, where's my weapon? Where's my weapon? And you know, my guys were like, what are you doing? <laughs> so I'm grabbing the crew chief's weapon and saying, that's my weapon. That's my weapon. He's like, that's my weapon. Get away from me. <laughs> and, uh, I found it. We hit the ground, ramp drop. People are running off the back and I had found it. And I ran off the back completely. I'm supposed to be in charge of the whole thing. And instead, I'm turning on knobs and setting, <laughs> switching everything. There's bullets flying everywhere. And I was like, only thing I can remember thinking was, thank God I didn't lose my weapon. Boy, would that be embarrassing. <laughs> so that's, 
That's that's pretty that's one awesome. I don't tell a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I appreciate you sharing that. That's pretty awesome. Um, there's there's front man. I'm not even going there. Never mind. Um, it probably wouldn't want me to say it anyway. But um, <laughs> yeah, if if you had, uh, I know people ask you this a lot too. But I'm gonna throw it out there because I know a lot of people ask me later, why didn't you ask? Um, somebody that wants to go the route that you did in the military, what would be the best advice that you could give them? Uh, I'd say the best advice is you better look at it long term mm-hmm. and don't look at it as in I'm going to get some kind of neat and shiny pen and then go out and write books about how to barbecue, you know, or something <laughs> like that. It's because, I mean, it took me 10 years before I could even try out. And that's basically about, you can get there a little earlier, but you're not going to walk in off the street and take my route. Mm-hmm. You, I mean, I started out in infantry, then I went SF and then I went to the unit. I mean, it's, it's, it's not for somebody who wants to join right off the street, serve a few years and get out. Right. Um, the Navy has that. Oh, oh, I can't believe you went there. You know, um, so, I mean, you really got to think about long term. You're, you're making a career out of it. You're not doing it for, uh, you know, video game purposes. Mm-hmm. So is there a little bit of uh, a jealousy there with that comment? I mean, you know, <laughs> no, not the, at all. Uh, Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Just busting your chops a little bit. But uh, so infantry. So. That that was your specialty before you you were uh, infantry yeah. officer, yeah. And is that typically uh, the route most people take for that? Because I I tell yeah. you I can tell you naval special warfare, but I I'm ignorant to the whole army. Yeah, most of it's and it, but it's not by no it depends on what you, the uh, yeah I'd probably say eighty percent, but there's certainly twenty percent or aren't, and a lot of them end up going uh, like going SF. Because when you get commissioned uh, or you get your MOS for whatever, for the recruiter or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, and he's like, hey, a mechanic could be the quickest way for you to be a forest ranger. And you're in there being a mechanic going, what in the hell is this? Right. Well, those guys would be the kind of guys that say, look, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm going SF. But mm-hmm. the, um, uh, I actually don't know the statistic, but just knowing the people I know, I'd say it's probably 80%. Mm-hmm. But I could be way off. I mean, I'd have to talk to Yusasak and say, give me your demographics. That kind of thing. Right. Well, it's, it's a pretty safe guess at that number, I would say. Yeah. Um, now, were you prior enlisted or did you come in as an officer? Uh, I, well, I kind of was. I was in the Guard for a little bit, mm-hmm. um, but I don't really count that. So. <laughs> Weekend Warriors. I, I tell you what, um, I have a newfound respect for reservists. Uh, I'm, I'm no, active- I don't mean it that way. I just mean that when, when I was in, uh, after 9-11, everything changed. We're sure. all going to war now. It's sure. one team, one fight. But, Absolutely. I didn't mean it like that. Uh, uh, when I was in the guard, it was just kind of like show up on the weekend, eat your donuts and go home. Right. Uh, after, you know, we all started going to war, people kind of realized, hey, if we just show up on the weekend and eat a donut, we're going to get killed when we go overseas. Right. And so everybody takes it seriously. A two-way rifle range makes things get serious really quickly. That's true. It, so it, I didn't mean to, if anybody listening, I didn't mean that to, for today's warriors, I'll tell you that. I didn't take it that way at all. But the whole reason I brought that up is because um, – I'm active duty, uh, and I'm actually at a reserve center working with the reserves. And I, I never realized how much those guys actually do. Uh, yeah. uh, not only juggling, everybody thinks it's just one week in a month. Well, it's, it's so much more than that. You know, it is now. Yeah, Yeah. it definitely is. And it, the, uh, I've got, in fact, a real good friend of mine is, uh, active duty national guard works at bureau up in Columbia, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, um, those guys, you know, they were actually, saying, hey, this is getting kind of ridiculous. You expect me to do one weekend, but that one weekend takes me two weeks to get ready for the one weekend. And then I'm, I get one week off, and I'm cycling in for the next one. Right. Uh, and, and if you're in a senior leadership position, right. whether it's officer or enlisted, and officers, you, yeah. you're, you're never stopping, you know? Yeah. Um, it's, it's the little things that people don't think about, fit reps and, and, and uh, making sure your troops are taken care of. And it, it's not just... Well, even just laying on ranges and stuff. You can't do that the Friday you show up. That's got to be done somewhere right. before right. everybody else gets there. Lots of uh, behind-the-scenes work. So I, I take my hat off to those guys. It's, uh, it's really eye-opening, and, and um, I'm, I'm glad I had the opportunity yeah. to do it. But um, So are you, um, and I failed to do my research, so uh, you can haze me later for this, but uh, do you have any uh, nonfiction works that you've done or are considering working on? Uh, not any books. I've, I do have a blog. I've kind of slacked off on it now because I've been getting kind of busy. But uh, I, I write about national security affairs all the time. They can oh. go to my blog at brattailerbooks.com, and there's everything from, 
you know, females in combat arms to attacking Iran to just anything that strikes my interest. So I see some talking head on TV babbling about something, and I realize that guy didn't know what he's talking about. When I get mad enough, I'll write a blog about it. <laughs> so I've got – there's quite a few blogs on there, on terrorism, on ISIS, just about anything. Mm-hmm. Man, there's so many things that I want to ask you that I know I can't. So it's, it's frustrating. <laughs> well, it's about the blogs you can. <laughs> oh, sure. But I mean just, um, I don't know, geopolitical situations. Um, I, I think there's a lot of threats out there that people don't realize that they're actually threats because um, the mainstream media, if you will, they're too busy worried about taking down our president. Instead well, I'll of, tell you that one thing that I – I really get sick of is uh, it doesn't matter what station it is they all do it. Our uh, bumper sticker slogans for um, complex, complex problem sets. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so it's a uh, one side, whoever you pick a side, this side hates it. So therefore here's why it's bad. This side loves it. And here's why it's good. Well, it's a hell of a lot more complicated than either one of those. Right. There's a lot more going on here than just that. Um, ISIS alone, you know, people are like, uh, we shouldn't do anything with ISIS because they're just, you know, another group and other people like it's the end of times with ISIS. And it's much more complicated than that. There's a lot of stuff going on. That it just doesn't. I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, Turkey, we seceded the terrain for Turkey, which I, I completely disagree with. We shouldn't abandon the Kurds. I used to work with them. Um, Turkey's running amok now in northern Syria, cramming in a bunch of refugees. They're all getting their heads blown off. Uh, and that's against our national interests. Mm-hmm. Well, on the other hand, Turkey's now talking about going into Libya uh, and uh, – protecting Tripoli, which is the, our national force. That's what we say we support, and there's a, a warlord there, and it's about to take over Tripoli. Well, the warlord in Tripoli is working with the Wagner Group, a Russian private military company, to take over Tripoli. Hmm. Where in Syria, Turkey's working with the Wagner Group to help Assad. It's, it's not a clear-cut thing. It's complicated. Sure. So, and the whole world's like that. Right. If only it was as simple as the way they make it out yeah. to be. Right. But... Um... Yeah, that's uh, it's really mind-boggling. Uh, I, you know, I joke a lot with my friends. I, I, I really wish I tell them I, I want uh, President Trump to come out and be against the Second Amendment because uh, <laughs> then as, the Democrats would have support. It. Exactly. As soon as he, as soon as he does, you know, it'll be the first time in history Democrats are uh, supporting the Second Amendment. But, um, but anyway, Brad, I know your time is valuable, and I really appreciate you being on the show. Uh, any any parting words or, or words of wisdom, suggestions for anybody that um, – actually, we just had a, a listener pop in. I said, uh, so how can we get any of your books? Um, it's it's called Go to Amazon, dumbass. And, uh, no, didn't go to – if they go to bradtaylorbooks.com, my website, um, mm-hmm. there's excerpts of every book I've written. Uh, and it's also obviously links. But, I mean, anywhere books are sold, at Barnes & Noble, grocery stores, they're they're out there. Uh, yeah. But they can read an excerpt. From, oh, my wife's going to kill me if I don't. I got to show this. Uh oh. Just got it. It's just a brand the, new one. The new one? Oh, look at that. Excellent. Why is it backwards? Have you seen it straight up? Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah, it comes backwards. It, it'll be. It comes backwards to me. So, right. yeah, we just got these. It didn't come out until January 7th, but it came in the mail yesterday. My publisher sent me the very first one. That's and awesome. It's January 7th. That... Which, by the way, Wagner Group's in that one, which is why I know so much about him right now. I do a lot of research <laughs> on. Big surprise. Right? Um, yeah. All right, guys. Uh, thanks for listening to the show. We we appreciate you coming on, and uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors. We've got uh, Math Mantis Productions. Uh, we've got uh, Crushing Dream. I'm sorry, Building Dreams General Contracting. Uh, we have uh, well, you guys know them all by now, Jesus. But um, Brad, uh, appreciate you being on, and and hang tight while I run us out of here, and sure. uh, we'll go from there. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, no, sir. But the pleasure is all mine. I, I'm, I mean it to the heart. Hang on one second, and we'll get on out of here. All right, everybody. We will talk to you guys soon, and uh, stay tuned tonight because we've got JTF 22 uh, to 0 coming on, and um, we also have Nothing's Off the Table. We will be back again at uh, 8.30 p.m. Central Daylight Time, so don't miss the show. And we out of here.